of the Lord Jesus Christ. Before I come to the text today, I'm reading Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. We're looking at verse 13. Now, when they saw, we're talking here about the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ, the disciples of the Lord, the people that have come to the presence of the Lord, and now these people were not there, the members of the Sanhedrin. And it says these council, these leaders, these religious administrators, when they saw, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. That's what we want to take back home. As you go back and other people see your life, they see your appearance, and they see your commitment and comportment, and they see your conduct and character, and then although they don't know you've come to the conference, it says, when they will see, not just the boldness, the righteousness, the commitment, the holiness, and when they see, the practical evidence of the outworking of the Spirit of God in your life. Taking the scriptures, translating it into a very living entity, and then they see that demonstrated just before them. And then they know you have not been to all these theological high-rising schools or seminaries, and then they just know you are simple hearted people believing the word of God and living it out then they'll be able to take knowledge you have been with the Lord I came in on uh, Tuesday and when I came in uh, one of our guest speakers was just going and uh, so I felt I should have the privilege of meeting him and so at the gate I waited for him because just about to go and I was coming in and then he came into the car while driving. And uh, he commented and said, Oh, it's a good uh, conference. And, uh, but I was still waiting because, you know, when people in the West, when they talk to you, and you don't take the first sentence, so you have to also read below the line and below the last sentence. And, uh, you know, he just commented and said it was, it was wonderful. And uh, your young people are... Uh, also wonderful uh, but you know that word wonderful you can use it in various ways and then you know we probed a little and it just said that it looks like you really need to help your young people uh, to be like the young people because that uh, preacher is familiar with the work we're doing in Nigeria and he respects the work we're doing in Nigeria. And he said, it looks like you really want to work on your young people so that what we've seen back in Nigeria will be able to see over here too. That's what he took away from here. That's what he saw. And you want to so live and you want to so demonstrate the things we're learning so that the people who see us, they will take knowledge that you are being with the Lord. And that's why we're having this challenge and we're saying, as we go back to our various church locations, we don't just leave our children to, you know, children are children, but then Samuel was a child. And it was in the midst of a family, Ophna and Phinehas were there. And Ophna and Phinehas did not influence Samuel in a negative way. Samuel knew who he was. You, re you remember Jabez? You remember Jeremiah? Those were children and they were so taught. Do you remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Their parents so taught them. 
And that when they go to Babylon, now Babylon, they took knowledge of those children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that these ones have got a taste of the religion of their fathers. And then Daniel too, those were teenagers when they came to Babylon. And yet, because of what they saw of their lives, their parents must have been doing something to help those young people. Do you remember Timothy? Don't allow anybody to despise your youth. It was a young person. And yet, what they saw in their lives showed very much that these had been of the Lord. And then we parents, too, we adults, Moses was much of an adult 80 years of age that's that's an adult and aaron 83 that's an adult and miriam older than both of them that's an adult and pharaoh saw something about them and so whether we're adults or we're youths or we're children we have come to this conference when we go back let them see that we are being with the lord and we're going to start demonstrating that here uh, when we finish now the conference. After finishing the conference, the way we leave this holiday center, the people who are here should take knowledge that that was a Christian conference. You know, this place is, you know, a public domain. And other people also come here. And there's some other clubs or societies that may have to have that may come for conference now. If let's say the Muslims want to have a conference and they come here, and the Mormons want to have a conference and they come over here, and other people want to have a conference, they come over here, and deeper life wants to have a conference and they come here, the people who are here. They will, they will be able to see that was a Muslim conference, that was a Mormon conference, and that was another religious conference, and this is deeper life conference. They should be able to tell from what they see, the workers who are here, the workers who are, you know, going around in the compound, and then those who are also in the cafeteria, they should be able to tell that one was different. And the difference is they had been with Christ. And apart from the conference people, those workers, me, I go to a lot of places. And I go to places that uh, I told you before, not deeper life, just a Pentecostal, uh, you know, conference. I'm invited to speak. And then I go to normal you know, theological uh, seminaries, and they invite me. They want me to share some things of them. And when I see them, and then I come to deeper life. And young people are there too in those other places. And I watch them. I see the things they do. I should be able to take knowledge that this is deeper life, and that we are being with Christ. And so, anytime I come, I want to see that we have been taught. And I want to see that the evidence of learning has been there. You can't blame me for wanting to see. I can't blame you too for wanting to see. That's why God gave us eyes and we're seeing. But when, when I come next time, I pray, I believe, I'll see something much, much better. I mean, good day, amen. And so, and that's the reason we're here. We're not here for just to entertain ourselves. We're here so that we'll be able to say, here is what Christ demands. And he has the right. He's Lord, he's King, he's Master, he's King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He has a right to demand of the people he died for, of the people he shed his blood for, that this is the way to live. And so, uh, when he talks like that, he says, I'm coming back. And when I come back, this is what I want to see. And these are the people I'll be taking back home. I pray you'll be ready at that time when he comes in Jesus' name. A good, good amen I need. Praise the Lord. Now we're talking about the final future supernatural change. It's a change. And it's going to be future change. And it's going to be a final change. It's going to be a supernatural change. We're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, 
But we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we, tell me the rest, shall be changed. We shall be what? We shall be changed. Now look at this. Behold, I show you a mystery. What's a mystery? The mystery, the way the New Testament uses the word, is something hidden, something veiled, something covered, something you cannot see through, something you don't understand. And Paul the Apostle said, Behold, I show you a mystery, which means then, at the time it was a revelation for Paul, it was still a mystery for the Corinthians. And when he now said, I show you, by the time he showed them, it became a revelation. Listen, it was a mystery. It's revealed. It's unveiled. It's demonstrated and described. And it becomes a revelation. If you look at Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 3. Look at the word revelation. Look at the word mystery verse 3 how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery can you see those two words there it was a mystery nobody knew it it was not clear nobody understood it but now by revelation he made it known unto me look at verse 4 it says whereby when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. You'll read it, you'll hear it, and then you understand it. It becomes a revelation for you, and you understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men. It was not made known. When it was not known, it was a mystery. But now it says, as it is now revealed. It's now a revelation. It was a mystery. But now it's revealed, so it's a revelation. Revealed unto the holy apostles and the prophets by the Spirit. But I want to take you back to uh, the Bible, Bible history. God told Noah. And he said, get ready, there's a flood coming. That was revelation for Noah. It was a mystery for that generation. And Noah began to show them, to make known unto them that that was coming. But nobody believed, nobody accepted. It was still a mystery for them. The thing that's the revelation for us is a mystery for the people of the world. That's why Paul the Apostle said, Corinthians, get ready. I show you. I reveal to you, I describe for you a mystery so that the revelation I have, which is a mystery for you, will be a revelation. Now, eventually the flood came and the flood left and, and finished. And then you have the time of Moses. And God said, Moses, I'm taking those children of Israel, I'm taking them out of the land of Egypt. That was a revelation. For Moses, that was still a mystery for Egypt. What is the revelation for the church? It's a mystery for the people of the world. And then you come on now to the New Testament. Before you come to the New Testament, it says a child is born. And his son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And you'll call his name Emmanuel. You'll call his name the mighty God, the everlasting father. is the prince of peace for Isaiah. That was a revelation for Herod. Even when it happened in the first pages of the New Testament, it was still a mystery. And the wise men came from the east. What have you come to do? We well, want to see the one that is born, the king of the Jews. Where did you hear that? Where did you pick up that? It was still a mystery for Herod. It was revelation for them. And now we come to this. And Paul the apostle said, this is a revelation. Christ will come again. I said, Christ will come again. If you went to the street over there and then you met somebody and you said, are you 
preparing to meet that person coming. He says, who? You say, Christ, and that he's coming. He says, how can that be? To him, it's a mystery. For us, it's revelation. Christ is coming again. That's when that final change, that's when that future change will take place. And here it says, behold, I show you a mystery. And then in telling us, I show you a mystery, it tells us what's all about. It says, we shall not all die, we shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. We shall not all die. When it says, well, we shall not all sleep, it's talking about death. And then it says, when we are not all going to die, how about what God had said? In Genesis, dust thou art, and dust thou shalt, to dust thou shalt return. That's the mystery we're talking about. If you hold on to that, for you this is going to be a mystery. But don't you know in that same Genesis chapter 3, it says, dust thou art, and dust to dust thou shalt return. And then for God to tell us that that's not going to be a general thing in all generations for all people, it took Enoch. Did Enoch die? That's the mystery. That's the mystery. That he was taken away and translated without seeing death. How about Elijah? Did Elijah die? No. He took him away. For the people who are holding on to doors, returning to doors, that rapture of Enoch, that rapture of Elijah was a mystery. And then Jesus Christ, don't you remember? He had died. He was buried. He rose up again. Which day? On the third day, and then he appeared to his own disciples by many infallible proofs for how many days? For 40 days. On that final 40th day, he was just talking to them, giving them the final instructions. And while giving them those final instructions, all of a sudden, without the power and the force of gravity being able to hold him down, he began being lifted up and he went up like that and went into heaven. Don't you know that was a mystery to them? Did he, it wasn't announced that was going to take place. And that is how he went to heaven. While they were gazing up into heaven, two angels appeared and said, Ye men of Galilee, why are you standing here looking and gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, as you have seen him go up into heaven, he will come again. That's a mystery for the people. Now the children, the children of God, those disciples and those apostles, when those angels told them he is coming back, that was revelation for the members of the Sanhedrin, the council, religious council, back in Jerusalem, in their sanctuary, in their temple, in their synagogue. It was still a mystery. They have, even, they have not even been able to unravel, unveil, or understand the mystery of the death and the resurrection, not to talk of his coming back again.